saying to one of the peacemakers, uh, or someone else was saying rather, light at the end of the tunnel. And I said, where's the tunnel? <laughs> I, I just like to say that in terms of inspiring, I don't feel terribly inspiring at the moment because my left leg is hurting and I can't stand up as uh, my dear uh, friend, uh, if I may call you, uh, 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 friend uh, Evelyn Lindner has just done to address us apart from which I probably would not appear above that uh, lectern, but she's so tall that she can advise, uh, uh, talk to you from on high. But I'd like to say that there is nothing new under the sun in terms of the golden rule. Uh, the golden rule, according to Pittacus in 650, was do not to your neighbor what you would take ill from him. That simple thought that direct, that imaginative thought has gone through history. We hear from the Mahabharata. This is the sum of duty. Do not unto others which would cause you pain if done to you, 300 BCE. And then we continue, of course, Jesus of Nazareth tell, tells us in 1440 BCE, or forgive me, in 30 BCE, the 30 uh, of the Christian era, therefore all things, whatsoever ye would that man should do to you, do you even so to them. And it continues through Islam, through Judaism, through nine faith groups with whom I had the privilege of serving during my uh, work as moderator for the World Conference on Religions and Peace. But today, however, I'd just like to start by quoting Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, who in 1955 told us, remember your humanity, forget the rest. And today I read sadly in the Daily Telegraph, tell us about your love life or we'll kick you out. Israel warns visitors to the West Bank. Foreigners visiting the West Bank must tell Israel if they fall in love with a Palestinian. Under new rules, that will significantly increase Israel's control over those living under military occupation. And I referred the other day in conversation to the emotionscape. Not the landscape, but the emotionscape. And I feel genuinely I mean, who am I to say it? But I do feel that we have to ask ourselves, and I hope to speak for a few minutes and then invite you to put your questions because I don't think you want a monologue about the need for dialogue. The questions that I would put to you and that I put to myself include how can human dignity become a guiding framework for policies? In the work of the Independent Commission on International Humanitarian Issues, ICIHI, I'd just like you to know that I've been here before institutionally. In 1998, about a quarter of a century ago, the report stated the human person in today's world is particularly vulnerable, the human person. In uh, the words of Imam Ali in Arabic, al-insan sunwan, a person is either your peer in God's creation or your brother in, in, in faith. Wars continue to plague developing countries. This is 1998. Today, violence all over the world is actually more significant in its proliferation than the so-called wars that are taking place as we speak, of which in my region we've had one every three years. And I'll come back to that in a moment. In scores of countries, torture is becoming institutionalized as an instrument of state control and repression. Weapons of indiscriminate destruction are being used increasingly in armed conflicts 
while nuclear weapons have become the sword of Damocles of modern times. I have served for 20 years on the Nuclear Threat Initiative, calling for a limitation on weapons of mass destruction to no avail. Starvation continues to be used as a means of suppressing opposition, while control over civilian population serves as a tactic, as well as an objective of armed conflict. I'm telling all of this not to get angry, we're angry enough as it is, but to get even within the system, if that is possible. The world often, always, and, and, and often speaks in terms of fighting against something. And I remember uh, Desmond, Tutu, Desmond Tutu, of course, and I remember my colleague on the commission, I remember uh, Walter Sisulu saying, why is it that we always have to fight against something? I remember Yehudi Menuhin from the Northern Hemisphere saying, why can't we struggle for something? Which led to the idea of the creation of a parliament of cultures, which actually we managed to do and existed for as long as our budget, which was rather a shoestring budget because I'm not a money prince and I don't get on very well with those who've acquired uh, their riches but have no intellectual generosity. I recall quite recently meeting uh, the president of the Hebrew University a few years ago. Uh, president Sasson said to me, we want to thank you for what you did for us in the 11th century. I said, well, it's a bit before my time, but uh, if you're talking about the translation of the classics, we were all involved in the translation of the Persians, Greeks, Hebrews, Arabs, but today in the 22nd century, or the 21st century, over the next 100 years, are we to expect intellectual generosity from you? And this is the sadness that even intellectual achievements are under lock and key, are given as part of a marchandise, a commercial uh, exercise rather reminiscent of the Internet of Things. Globalization, by definition, has no culture to it. And the Internet of Things and the Internet of Matter is uh, so important as it appears to us today. I don't want to get into the etymology of uh, human axiom, axios, which is the closest approximation to the Latin word for dignity. But in 1755, Samuel Johnson published his two-volume dictionary of the English language and defined equality as the same degree of dignity. Dignity is first and foremost a search for the universal. When understood and prioritized, it is the tool to transcend from pol polarity, cultivation of hatred, I uh, have spoken, and therefore I am right, and all of you are wrong, polarity. And, of course, what we would seek in a, in, in a better world, plurality, respect for the other, and uh, the definition of what we call creative commons. This region has a long history rooted in demand for human dignity and a desire for agency over its fate. The Arab Nahda, the Arab Renaissance, included the Syrian question, which of course evolved into the question of Palestine, but also, let's be, be frank, the question of Lebanon, the question of Jordan, the question of Iraq, Bilad al-Sham, were all byproducts of the early Arab inclination towards a constitution which in 1919 was made possible in Damascus by Faisal and the Arab free thinkers, and then in 1928 for a very short period of time until the imperialist power chucked it out in, in Egypt as well. It became very clear that dealing with the great powers was dealing in matter, in deliveries of canals, waterways, uh, weapons deals, training armies, and then promoting the military to uh, represent 
national movements. So I want to say that the peoples of West Asia and North Africa, once again, let me tell you, have experienced on average some form of warfare every three years. The burden of these wars goes beyond public health, physical health, to mental health, to the destruction of the environment and the ecosystem, the obliteration of livelihoods, targeting museums, libraries, and cultural sites, and all aspects that sustain memory and convey meaning to societies. This region now accounts for almost half of the world's population of forcibly displaced people. We are seeking, as I work with you, Mary, on the uh, council in Canada, the Refugee World Refugee Council, we are seeking protracted refugee situations, becoming, we are seeing, forget me, forgive me, protracted refugee situations becoming the norm, the norm, rather than the exception in the 21st century. Peaceful sociospheres, Peaceful societies are built upon the enablement and the empowerment of the vulnerable and the marginalized, not on patronage, are built upon a scientific understanding of what poverty really means. Fahras al Hirman al Mutaadid. So that we understand a little better what we are talking about, we have tried at the Human Resource Development in, uh, Department in Jordan to say, well, you don't want a job because you're underqualified. Why are you underqualified? What is your home situation? Humanizing the stats. That is one of the inspirational messages I would like to underline. In the words of Albert Einstein, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And that's what I've told myself after every devastating war, 1967, 1973, 1980s, Iraq and Iran, 1990s, Iraq, Iraq and Kuwait, and so forth, where this country has been the uh, dumping ground for large numbers of people who have contributed to whatever it is that we claim to promote as a regional hub of stability. But I want to add in my remarks that the first chapter of Winning the Human Race defined at that time, 1989, that humanitarianism demands that whatever detracts from human well-being must be questioned regardless of its effects on economic growth, political power, or the stability of a certain order. We're always told world order, and I just wonder why world order can't include these imperative uh, ethical points of departure. Turning to the questions, how can human dignity become a guiding framework for policies? Rudolf Kehlen, the founder of the German geopolitical school, German-Swedish, who kind, not unlike you, <laughs> coined the phrase geopolitics as early as 1899. Geopolitik, as the problems and conditions within a state that arise, arise from its geographic features. Ecopolitik, as the economic factors that affect the power of the state, and demopolitik, the nation's ethnic and social elements and the problems that they create. I would like to think that they do not create problems without offering us solutions. In fact, in my short time with the Club of Rome, we were always told every meeting we should have a problematic and a resolutic. We don't want to curse the darkness. We want to light a candle. To Kielen, the state is a biological creature or life form with its own dynamic and logic, power and will. And will includes us all, of course, because we are all 
part of what we now call the state. But isn't it true that since, corona, uh, since this uh, COVID-19 and uh, since the last two years of isolation from each other, loneliness has increased, remoteness has increased, obfuscation of so many issues, including education and health, leaves us bewildered by what the next directive can be. And it is only then that we realize that maybe the organic unity of land and people, an organism with body and soul, and a personality on the international stage, is being taillé, reduced to a very small size. So, as with COVID, COVID transcended borders, international borders. And yet here, in this region, thought does not transcend borders. Because with all due respect to the new innovations of technology and communications, I don't believe that thoughts are being conveyed in a, matter, in a manner in which we can dialogue our future. I noticed a few days ago the BBC picked up on our reintroduction of philosophy into schools in Jordan. And they interviewed a lady who was obviously totally against philosophy. Although we haven't had philosophy in our schools, I'm embarrassed to admit, in over 40 years. And instead of explaining the fact that philo, love, sophia, of wisdom, is what we are seeking. She insisted that we have enough on our plate, as it were, in terms of religious, religious education, not to require learning by analogy. And I cannot, cannot honestly believe that the living being, as Kaelin described him, that is infected by internal conflict, polarization, and indignation would not decay if left to its own devices. We have to open our minds. Imagination, as Einstein said, is more important than knowledge. And I agree with the, the concept. The Mashriq or the Levant, as we are sometimes called, where the sun rises, Descartes reminds us that uh, if everything in this world was west, where does the sun rise? And in this, I just want to say that the Mashriq is, and I'm happy to say it, a very diverse place, both religiously and ethnically, but people are retrenching into the comfort of smaller and louder identities. Identities built in opposition to other identities. An understanding of inclusive security and the promotion of a collective sense of citizenship and responsibility is crucial. How do we achieve this? At least by defining what we are talking about in terms of landscape and emotionscape. I want to take you on a journey of such definition for just Two minutes. Halfa John Mackinder asserted that whoever commands the world island encompassing Afro-Asia, Afro-Eurasia, commands the world. The heartland is the center of the world, stretching from the Russian Volga River to China's Yangtze River and from the Himalayas to the Arctic. The Arabian Peninsula and the Levant are only the bridge, or, or are the only bridge, connecting Africa to Europe and to Asia. The heartland and are therefore a historical site of entanglement and a critical intercontinental gateway. If you look from the Arabian Sea, the Indian Ocean, up towards uh, the Black Sea, up toward the Adriatic, and then follow the rivers all the way up to the Balkans, what do you see? You see an inflated oval, 
And this is the interconnection between Asia and Europe, what is often called Eurasia. So the point that I'm trying to make is that there are reasons why war is visited on us on a regular basis. And those reasons amount to material reasons. And I don't have to restate what they are because this is not a political meeting. They are not human reasons, that I would state, because the dignity of human beings has to be questioned in the context of how do we replace the doctrine of dispensability with an ethic of human solidarity. Many people find it easy to recognize the dignity of members of their own class, their own faith, their own race, or their own culture. Humans have usually divided themselves throughout history into members of the in-group, who enjoy dignity and value. We often hear Western leaders talking about Western values, but I have yet to hear one saying such as, and explaining, and those of the out-group who have second-class status at best. Remember that it is no longer fashionable to love your neighbor as yourself in certain parts of this region. Many people see forms of intolerance, including xenophobia and religious intolerance, which are based on this ethic of exclusion as the norm for today's world in this region. So what do we do? We turn in on ourselves and we say Jordan first, Iraq first, Syria first, Israel first, many firsts. But is there any possibility of getting away from the bad joke of the caricature that says, I want peace, a piece of Jordan, a piece of Israel, a piece of Syria, a piece of Iraq. And of course, when we continue into East Africa, we have to remind ourselves that Ferdinand de Lesseps did exist and he did build a canal. But the CCCT, the Climate Change Conference under Egyptian auspices is being held in Sharm el Sheikh which of course technically is Asia, but it's an extension of Egyptian hospitality, that they are hosting two conferences, and the second one is in Cairo. So uh, they get two bites at the cherry, African and Asian. And then we are told that there is yet another conference to be held uh, uh, in, in the context of the generosity of the United Arab Emirates in the United Arab Emirates, which I also thought was part of Asia, but now apparently the Gulf is uh, some form of a separate entity in its own right. Power talks. To place human welfare and dignity firmly at the center of the individual and collective concerns would be to realize an ethic of human solidarity. Some would say, God forbid. Instead of an ethic of exclusion. I cannot work with you unless I exclude the last three rows. Because that is powerful management of my resources and even my most valuable resource, which is the human being. An ethic of human dignity gives rise to a politics that respects each person in contrast to a politics in which individuals are considered expendable and dispensable for any reason. Poverty as a form of violence against human beings and their dignity is multidimensional. Traditional members, traditional measures of national income such as GDP per capita 
failed totally to capture the deprivations in health, education, and living standards that a person may face simultaneously. So I hope in group sessions you might like to come back to the concept of multi-deprivation index. A framework for the ethics of human solidarity includes a responsibility to examine and attempt to understand and action's full range of consequences and avoid one-dimensional thinking. We have too much tafkir takhassusi in our part of the world. I have so many letters after my name and therefore I am specialized in a certain aspect of health or education or whatever it may be. But to actually consider joined up handwriting, so to speak, and talk of interdisciplinarity. I mean, I can't believe, for example, why WEFE, W-E-F-E, -E, water, energy, food, and environment, cannot be taken as a single cluster. في الأردن أصدقائي اسمحوا لي أن أذكر بأن الأسباب الموجبة للتشريع تتبع صدور التشريع. السببية تتبع صدور القانون. The reasons, justifying reasons, the causalité, as they say in French, for legislation succeeds the promulgation of the law. Why? Because one of those four I mentioned in that cluster of WIFI feels that his or hers priorities are more important than the others. But if we are going to look at the process of climate change conferences and to have some benefit from the hundreds of billions of pledged funds, then we have to present a case which I think should also take into consideration that we don't transcend each other's silos, which is you know, what the United Nations need to, to do, and I recommend to you a paper by Sandeep Vasleker, the director of the Strategic uh, Studies Forum in Mumbai, where he talks about the urgent need for united peoples and not united nations. Because it is nations who are compromising the rights of future generations by not speaking of the future of peoples. A land without a people for a people without a land. That does not ring true to me. And therefore, I would like to remind you and remind myself, we have to make every effort to minimize harm and to compensate the sufferers when harm is unavoidably generated in pursuit of a competing good. To exercise discernment in the face of unintended consequences for harm Justifiable actions may hurt some people. However, it is essential to acknowledge any ill effects for what they are rather what they are, rather than insisting that they are acceptable because they cannot be avoided. With your permission, I, I could stop now and invite questions. I could continue, but I don't want to be the sole speaker in my session, which is described as potentially inspirational, which I don't feel at all, because I can only gauge reactions by uh, some of you who look, uh, you know, they, they wish they would be somewhere else, <laughs> and others who may have a, an even partial interest of, uh, of hearing more. So I would leave it in both your competent hands and uh, open the floor for questions.